it is indeed a great honor to be um, invited to speak at the launch of this uh, fascinating enterprise. Um, I've had the pleasure of working in Halifax um, over the years for um, some of your educational institutions, St. Mary's University, Halifax Grammar School, and um, it is a uh, unique and lovely city, and it's something that's truly worth fighting for. Uh, its future and the fact that you're all here, I think um, uh, you share that sentiment. I'm going to talk tonight mainly about um, some work that is being done in other municipalities across the country that we've been involved in, um, principally um, work that has been undertaken, we've undertaken for the city of Toronto which is the avenues and mid-rise strategy, which is one way of addressing some of these issues of how, how do we focus growth um, in a sustainable manner. Um, I hope that it has some relevance to some of the issues that you're going to be um, thinking about over, over the next year. But, before we get into the nitty gritty of that strategy, I just wanna pull everybody back for a minute to think about um, the big picture. Uh, why do cities matter? Um, what are the kind of challenges that not only HRM faces, but cities across the globe? And then I'll talk a little bit about this um, one strategy to address some of those issues. So, big picture. Why do city mat the cities matter? In 1900, there was 10% of the world's population living in cities. We just recently reached what we call the rural-urban divide, where now 50% of the world lives in cities. And we will, in the near future, um, three quarters of the world's population will be living in these human inventions called cities. Cities matter because they drive prosperity. 70% of the global gross domestic product uh, is generated by cities. And 37 of the world's largest of, of, the, of, of, of the 100 economies around the world, the largest are are actually cities. So, and just by sheer force, we have 3.3 to 3.5 billion people now living in cities. Cities really are the center, not only of innovation, of human enterprise, but of productivity. So if you actually compare the idea of a nation to an idea of a city, it's remarkable the power that the cities generate. And in fact, if you look at this chart, it's de demonstrating how cities contribute more GDP to their national economy than the relative size of their population suggests. So a city like Paris, which is uh, Ile de France on the left, generates um, a dis disproportionately high um, amount of the GDP uh, relative to its population. And increasingly, cities are even surpassing nations in their economic force. Uh, so this is a sort of chart of the great economies of the world, uh, the GDP revenues generated. And you can see, for instance, cities like Tokyo and New York are generating more than entire countries like Canada, um, which I think goes to the whole issue, not, not only of how cities think of themselves, but how nations think of the cities within them um, as the major generators um, of economies. Focusing in on Canada itself, in 1867, 20% of Canadians lived in cities. Today, 80%, 27. A uh, million out of 34 million people. Now, 
it's kind of unusual for architects to start off these presentations with statistics. Um, and although I am an architect and love practicing architect, architecture, everything that we do as a practice is through the lens of cities, of creating great communities, um, great places for people to live. Which goes to the second thing I'd like to talk, the second reason why cities matter. So we've now reached this urban divide where over three and a half billion of us live our life out in these cities. So the majority of human life is played out in an environment that is completely of our making. This is something we control. It is in fact, perhaps, the most grand human artifact that you can think of. And it's made by us. We don't inherit it from nature. Which begs the question, how are we doing? If we have, if, if this phenomena of the city is what's shaping our lives, is it good enough? Is it the best that it can be? And I think that that's the thing that we're all struggling with. Um, and frankly, it's why the profession of planning is a noble enterprise. And Andy didn't pay me to say that. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about today's challenges. And I think the introduction covered many of these themes. How do we accommodate growth while avoiding the inefficiencies, the economic inefficiencies, and the environmental impacts and costs, both financial uh, and to the planet of urban sprawl? How do we protect what's already good about our communities? And Halifax has uh, beautiful neighborhoods um, beautiful parks, uh, beautiful heritage infrastructure. How do we actually come up with a strategy to deal with this pressure of growth in a way that actually protects those resources? And how do we improve the living conditions uh, and human health for residents and create beautiful places that we want to live our lives out or as Andy said, that we want to pass on to our children and grandchildren. And how do we mitigate the very uh, profound environmental impacts of the city? So not, these are some of the questions that municipalities across the country, in fact, across the globe, are dealing with every day. So what I'd like, I'd like to now shift more to the, um, the specific case study um, of the Avenue strategy uh, and mid-rise buildings um, work, which this document actually was the product of a, um, a two and a half year process working uh, within the city of Toronto um, many, many consultation events just like this one tonight um, involved consultations with the public but also with the development community, um, with the people involved in planning issues, architects, urban designers, uh, transportation engineers. So Toronto's official plan, um, which I think actually is a, is a very good document, um, the basis of that plan starts with the premise, we have great neighborhoods and we are going to protect them. So what are we going to do with growth in a way that protects those neighborhoods? The plan says that growth will be focused on the downtown. It will be focused on certain growth centers, key centers outside of the downtown but connected to it by transit. And thirdly, that growth will be distributed 
along the avenues, the major um, main streets of the city. And that growth, um, Toronto is expected to accommodate another 500,000 residents within the next 18 years. And uh, Toronto's avenues constitutes um, 162 kilometers within the city, which actually provides you with 325 kilometers of frontage where you have properties facing either side of, of these main streets. Of those 324 kilometers, 75% has been designated for growth. That does not mean growth will happen um, to that extent because there are all kinds of existing um, buildings along those avenues now, but they tend to be very low intensity uses. Uh, two story buildings with retail on the ground floor and maybe an apartment above it, gas stations, um, lots of parking lots, things like that. And the character of these avenues is dramatically different as you move through the city. Um, so we have uh, in the sort of pre-war city, a fine-grained fabric of buildings, again, sort of in the two to three story range. Um, some of them quite successful as retail corridors, but others that are really struggling. Uh, and we also have the suburban um, avenues, which tend to be, of course, much bigger in terms of their cross-section and they have a lot more businesses that are sort of auto-oriented. They depend on automobile traffic, easy parking. You tend to see the fronts of those uh, businesses with parking lots in the front, as opposed to this finer grain pre-war fabric where the buildings came right to the edges of the sidewalks. These are some of the key avenues. Toronto is having this. Um, dramatic debate these days about what kind of transportation will happen along these corridors, whether they're subways or LRTs. Um, but you can see, for instance, in the middle uh, slide, Shepherd Avenue, which is a suburban area, where there's been significant investment in transit infrastructure, um, the new investments in housing and mixed-use buildings in this mid-rise format uh, is starting to occur. So why would you focus growth on the avenues? Um, for a number of reasons. As I said from the beginning, the principal premise is we're going to protect the great neighborhoods, the, the low-rise neighborhoods um, that are really the, the, the bones of the community. It makes sense to think about putting growth in areas where you've already invested in, where you already have the municipal infrastructure, um, the schools, the sewers, the water lines, the power, um, and most significantly, the transit. Um, the thing about avenues and main streets is they actually function as the kind of social nerve center of neighborhoods. If they're designed properly, these are the places that you walk to to go shopping. It's the places that you meet neighbors. Uh, it's the place where you find the basic services uh, and are able to hop on a bus or a streetcar. So actually building up the capacity of the avenue to act as the center of a neighborhood is critical. And by increasing the number of residents and jobs that are actually on those avenues, you create a condition where you can actually get better retail and better services and better transit because you've elevated the captive market that is going to use all of those things. 
which in turn improves the conditions for those people who live in the established neighborhoods within walking distance. So now instead of a couple of shops, a restaurant, you have a market that supports many different shops, many different restaurants, and a higher level of transportation. 